All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight uh, at the um, PO York chapter uh, event for 2022 council election candidate meeting. So I'm today's host. My name is Oliver Zhao. I'm the director of uh, business and community outreach at PO York chapter. So just uh, to quickly introduce you why we're here tonight, uh, what general uh, things that a council do, uh, you know, uh, for PO council, uh, they provide the function as the governing body as we are here, PO and board of directors of PO. They provide uh, the overall direction for the association and our profession. Uh, it all upholds PO's duty to protect the public interest. It sets and maintains the high standard for the profession, uh, professional engineering practice. They collaborate with government to respond to critical uh, policy issues and also recognizes emerging engineering disciplines. And as a member of council, uh, you will develop and drive the strategic direction for PEO, discuss and decide any issues relevant to the regulator uh, role, approve PO's budget, provide direction on regulatory priorities, and also ensure all the, respons uh, the responsible use of resources and effectively regulate the practice of engineering. So that being said, just quickly go through the agenda for tonight. Uh, we're starting events now. Uh, there will be a quick opening remark uh, from our uh, East Central Regional Councillor, uh, uh, Christopher Shaheen, uh, followed by uh, Council at Large, Vice President and President-elect statement. Uh, after that, we'll have a closing remark from our President, uh, Christian Berni. And uh, finally, we'll go through the voting instructions uh, before we sign off tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to our moderator tonight, Christopher Shaheen. He's our current East Central Regional Councillor. So I'm going to pass the control to Christopher. And Thank you all. And welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the York chapter today. In just a few minutes, we'll be hearing from our candidates running in the 2022 Professional Engineers Ontario elections. As some of you are aware, PO Council works to ensure that the Professional Engineers Act is updated. And it's updated to reflect the changes in the practice of engineering and respond to the evolving needs and expectations of the public. Take back a little bit of time here. And in 2010, the last time that was opened, 66 amendments were actually made with the input from council. Ultimately, council members are required to exercise their power with competence, diligence, and do it in the best interest of PEO. They owe what is called a fiduciary duty to PEO, which includes a duty of care, diligence, wisdom, and loyalty. With the candidates running for a seat on council, we wish them luck today. We'll begin shortly. So each candidate will have four minutes to explain their statements, and we would like them to touch upon the three questions below. The first question is, why is PEO Council elections important? The second, what is your plan to improve the low member engagement in the elections? And third, how do you plan to capture member interest concerns and bring them to council? So each member will have the four minutes. I will give them a 15 second warning. I will interrupt them at the 15 second mark and let them know that their time is ready to wrap up. After that, we will be going into a Q&A. I invite all participate, participating members today to put your questions in the chat. From the chat, we will filter through election-based questions. So we kindly ask that any questions for this election are election-based. So nothing about um, something that's been done on council before or anything like that. Uh, we want something relative to the elections. Any other questions outside of that, you are welcome to contact the candidates directly.
So we will begin by recognizing the incoming East Central Regional Counselor, David Kegel, who has acclaimed the position. And in my opinion, we're very lucky to have David on council, and I look very forward to working with him. Secondly, I would like to give recognition and respect to the late Peter Cushman, who was the senior East Central Regional Counselor. He was my dear friend and an active member of council and passionate leader. Our deepest condolences go to the Peter Cushman and his loved ones. We will now begin with the questions and candidate statements. We'll begin with counselor at large candidates. And again, we've gone through them in a alphabetical order. So by last name. So we have, do we have Vaj here with us today? I didn't see him log in. However, we will display his message and then we'll move on to the remaining candidates as they are present. So Vaj is running for counselor at large. His candidate statement is as follows. And if you'd like to contact him, uh, his information is here along with his website. Vaj, uh, one more call out to you. If you're on, you're welcome to speak. I am here. Welcome Vaj. Thank you very much. Sorry, I just joined uh, uh, like 30 seconds ago. <laughs> no worries. Welcome Vaj, you have four minutes uh, to give your candidate statement and answer the three questions about why is PEO council elections important? Uh, what do you do to, to improve the low member engagement? And how will you capture members' interests and bring that to council? You have four minutes starting now and I'll give you a 15 second warning when your time is up. Okay. Okay, uh, good evening and uh, welcome uh, to our chapter members and other candidates. My name is uh, Vajahad Bande. I go by name Vaj Bande. Uh, I'm a candidate for councillor at large. The reason why I am running in this election, PEO needs to change. We need to be a world leader in engineering self-regulation. Currently, it's not happening at PEO. PEO is turning into an organization which is run by clerks and government appointees. And those clerks and government appointees are making decisions on your behalf without any input from the members, from you. Uh, one of examples of that was we were promised in 2015 that there would be a referendum on uh, continuous professional development. And that right has been taken away uh, from us by uh, Council, current council members, and one of the candidates who is a uh, uh, who is still on the council actually voted to have that referendum repealed. Uh, the other reason I am running for this election is PEO is still set up in 1930s. We have never done anything about what is called the emerging disciplines. Emerging disciplines like uh, software engineering, biomedical engineering, nanotechnology, uh, extra. Um, are one of the fastest uh, emerging fields in, uh, in the field of engineering, yet PEO mandate the way it currently is, doesn't cover these emerging disciplines in its uh, form. So that needs to change. Hence the reason I am running. The, uh, the third and most important, other most important issue is, uh, we have a council uh, which, ha uh, which is set up uh, to change governance um, and, uh, and it's trying to erode the chapter system and it's, it's uh, pretty much focused on Clayton report. One of its recommendations is to get rid of the elected councillors and only have appointed councillors. So those co appointed councillors, whether they are PNGs or not, they'll be making decisions on your behalf, on behalf of membership uh, without any input from you. Uh, so that needs to change and that needs to stop. And PU actually is already on its uh, the current council is already on its way to have the full implementation of uh, Clayton reports. Uh, the, I have a lot of experience volunteering for PEO. I have volunteered for PEO chapter systems, three different chapter systems. I started with Mississauga chapter, which is West Central. Then I moved to Scarborough chapter, which is your sister chapter, East Central. And finally, uh, uh, for the last uh, more than a decade, I have been in Georgian Bay, which is Western. Um, I have been a past chair of a Georgian Bay chapter, uh, vice chair, past chair, uh, and chair uh, for two years. And in addition- to, One minute uh, left. Okay. I have served on various PEO committees and I was a lieutenant governor appointee 
uh, uh, for uh, PE of Council in 2019. So um, I am asking for your vote. I am not a um, establishment candidate compared to others. So I am just for the membership. I am for you. I am going to be your representative and I am a chapter person. Uh, please visit my website www.votevag.com to know more about me as a candidate. Thank you very much, Vaj. We really appreciate you being here with us today. The next person running for Councilor at Large candidacy is Chantel Chittle. Chantel, are you with us? Yes, I am. Fantastic. So Chantel, once again, you have four minutes uh, to give your candidate statement, which we encourage you to also answer uh, why you think PO council elections are important. What will you do about improving low engagement? And also, how do you plan on bringing uh, member concerns to the council table, along with your candidate statement? You have four minutes starting now. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for hosting this event. My name is Chantal Chittle, and I am running for councillor at large. I have served on council as the Eastern Regional Councillor since 2020 and have been a chapter volunteer for an additional 13 years. My first introduction with PEO and volunteering was over two decades ago while attending Lakehead University. There I volunteered with the Engineering Student Society and helped organize a joint conference with PEO and undergraduate students from around Ontario. Jumping forward to these days, um, I support the need to complete changes within the PEO organization at the staff level and council level. In my opinion, modernizing and improving our processes at council is extremely important to ensure effective regulation of the profession. I've noted before that my priorities include the modernizing of the licensing process, including capturing and regulating emerging disciplines, meaningful consultation with members and chapter volunteers, and addressing recommendations from external reviews and developing key performance indicators to track our successes. I support PEO's volunteers and understand the value of our chapter system and what it provides for us. I want to work with council, staff, and other volunteers to continue the good work our chapters do. I support the use of clearly defined metrics that consider real potential and perceived risk. We must consider possible risks and the measures to mitigate those risks in making any decision at council. Um, one of the questions that you posed was the low member engagement, and that's been a long-standing issue. Um, and I think that the only way to um, address it or move it forward to engage more is to have effective and meaningful consultation. I know for um, the many years past when I graduated uh, university, and at the beginning of my career, I found that um, PO didn't really have much to offer me as a young engineer. Um, it was, I, I perceived the organization to be um, just not keeping um, with, with people of, of, you know, that, that were um, young and, and in different, um, different parts of the profession. Um, why are the, why is PO important or why are the elections important? By participating in, in, our, in our process, um, we can contribute to the profession to, uh, you know, meet uh, and fulfill the duty of, of counsel and to protect for protection of the public interest. Um, and um, I can't remember what the third question was. So um, I, I think over the last year or so, or actually a couple of years, there have been some um, good progress made to modernize some of the processes um, at PEO and on and for council, and hopefully we can see even more successes with some of the streamlined processes um, at the committee level as well. Um, I would like to continue to to work um, with PEO and and council uh, to continue some of the good work that we we have started. Um, and I hope that um, you see fit to, um, to vote for me and uh, tell a friend, tell a colleague, um, and hopefully we'll get more people to um, vote in this election. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Chantel. Good timing, right on time. Thank you very much. And that third question was, what were you going to do to engage members and bring that issue to council. You do have 30 seconds if you'd like to answer. Sure, thanks. Um, you know, you know there, there's so many ways to do that, holding um, 
evenings like this, town halls, virtual meetings um, that allow more people to come together from uh, larger areas uh, than are available in a, in a physical world. So uh, that's all we can do is, is ask for input and, and share that information with others on council. That, that's all I have for that. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Thank you again. Our next candidate running for Councillor at Large is Daniel Lamb. Daniel, you have four minutes and we'd like you to answer those three questions. As mentioned, they are why is PEO Council elections important? What's your plan to improve the low engagement? And how do you plan to capture member interests, concerns, and bring them to Council along with your candidate statement? Your four minutes starts now. Thank you so much, Christopher. Thank you, Oliver. And thank you for the PEO York chapter for hosting today's event there. Um, I'm actually somebody who my current residents allow me to, my home base to be a York chapter member. And I appreciate all of the hard work that you guys have done in order to be able to improve the engagement levels at PEO. Um, so for my side is that addressing specifically the questions, the first one is how and why is PEO council elections important? We're lucky in Canada to be actually living inside a nation that has the value of democracy. PEO elections are important because it is a chance for members like yourself to have your voices heard and have councillors elected onto council who actually represents what it is that you want as members. For me, I'm somebody who stands for low PEO fees. I am against all forms of mandatory continuing education, including that of the peak program. And I'll get to an explanation of that later on. Decisions that you make now have a fundamental impact with regards to what the future of PEO as well as the engineering profession is going to be like there. So for me, the second question here is, what is your plan to improve the persistent low member engagement? This is actually a very, very interesting question because low member engagement, if we look at it from a regulation perspective, the regulation only says that the mandate of PEO is supposed to be protecting the, the interests of the public. There's nothing with regards to membership engagement, but I guess in short there, if we look outside of the Canada and the framework as a whole there, is that if we want to increase the participation rate when it comes to these elections, increase the number of people that wants to come to these chapters, the simple solution, if you follow in Australia, is to make it mandatory that they have to vote, that they have to come to these meetings in order for them to be a member of PEO and have their PN license. I'm not saying I'm somebody who supports that mandatory threshold, but I'm saying this is actually one way that you could improve membership engagement, but we have to look at it. Why do we want membership engagement? The PEO chapters like this York chapter are here, is excellent with regards to giving opportunities for people to participate, engage, network, enhance the qualification, as well as enhance the PEO professions as a whole. We need to preserve the PEO chapter system. We need to have more events like these to allow our members to be out there with regards to participating. Just this month, I was involved with regards to in hosting a virtual event as it relates to celebrating Lunar New Year's. That event had over 130 participants. Please remember, February is Black History Month. I'm actually involved later One on. One minute left. With regards to hosting an event associated with celebrating Black History Month as well too. So for more information about my campaign, please visit my website, www.votedl.ca. It's been a pleasure running so far, and it's been great hearing from each of the individual members. Without you, PEO wouldn't be where it is today. And I would love to hear from you because that's the way how we build up this engagement in our future of our profession. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. We appreciate your time. Our next candidate running for the 2022 council elections in the role of counselor at large is David Lapp. David, you have four minutes to provide your candidate statement and answer the three questions mentioned prior. Sure. Your time yeah, starts now. Much. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, 
my name is David Lapp, and uh, I'm a relatively new kid on the PEO block in the sense that for the past 20 plus years, I've been on, on staff at Engineers Canada. So I bring a, a national and international perspective on regulation to the PEO regulatory world. I've worked a lot with PEO and uh, the 11 other uh, regulators in Canada on the, the various issues from a staff perspective. So I think I bring that kind of experience and expertise and network of contacts that I will bring to the table if, if elected. Uh, I, um, my, my sort of focus is, is on the strategic plan that's coming up, given that council will, uh, will largely have finished uh, its, all, all the governance things. And I believe that the strategic plan is a way that we can engage with members and, and improve our, our engagement with, uh, with members in the sense that we can actually start to work on tools and processes that support engineers in their practice and show value for what we're doing. So one of the things I note about uh, probably, you know, with our 85,000 members or so, uh, many of them, uh, if you pay your dues and you stay out of trouble, uh, you have very little contact with PEO out of that whole 85,000, probably a very large percentage. That's how much they know about PEO and are engaged in it. And part of that is because once they're registered, we almost ignore them in their practice. And I think uh, we need to do a lot more work in the practice period when an engineer is practicing for 40 years. And so I feel that uh, we need to provide much more practice guidance. And in particular, I bring to the table my work on climate change, sustainability and environment as some of the key issues that are relevant to society uh, and Ontario. Um, and I think PO needs to be at the table with government on that and uh, to show that we're, we're at the table. We have a, have a profile with government and with the public on these issues that affect the public interest and could benefit from an engineering perspective. In terms of capturing member interest, I feel that uh, the chapters are a vital part of uh, the um, system of PEO because with that many members and the geographic distribution, it would be impossible to have an ivory tower in Toronto that's dictating to everyone. So the chapters are really important, very strong supporter, and I feel there are mechanisms that we can use to reach and engage with members with more, more member uh, events and that sort of thing. And as councillor, I will do my best to reach out across the province since we're a councillor at large. So I would uh, really try to encourage uh, that. And I've started to do that in the climate change sphere, but certainly looking at that in other spheres. And uh, I guess as One far, as, left. As, far as, uh, as the importance of, of the election, I feel that you know it's a privilege to be able to be a self-regulated profession and, and uh, elections of people who reflect the, uh, the interests of members and uh, also serving the public interest is, and having the ability to do that is extremely important. It is dismaying to see the, the very low turnouts of, of elections. Hopefully we do better in this one and we will do better going forward. Um, and I would also just say as a final comment that any of these issues that we talk about, whether through myself or my other fellow candidates, uh, one has to realize this is going to take many years. Uh, we can't Ten solve everything left. at once. We can't solve everything at once. Uh, we need a sustained and tenacious effort for many years It'll start with the strategic plan coming up. Thank you. Great timing. Thank you, David. And we appreciate your comments today. We'll go to the chat now for any questions relating to the elections that you can ask to any of the candidates. We'll open the chat for a few seconds here for anyone that wants to provide their question to the candidates. At this time, there are no questions directed at the candidates about Keep in mind, any questions will be asked to all the candidates and not just one of the candidates. So that will be a fair Q&A. Thank you, Mr. Carlos, for your question. Um, so we're going to take your question and reword it a little bit towards all the councillors uh, that are running, sorry, all the councillor candidates that are running. Um, so we will start with Vaj. Um, what is your perspective of climate change 
and would how much energy would you put into it? The climate change is an alarming issue. It has been at our face for the last 30, 40 years. And it's not the only issue uh, we as engineers who are at the forefront, uh, forefront of the technological uh, innovations uh, should be dealing. There will be many other issues uh, members have to look at. So um, the way PEO mandate is, we cannot deal it through council. However, there is a way to deal with the environmental issue of the climate change. It is through uh, uh, PSC, uh, uh, Professional Standards Committee. We need to raise it at that level before it reaches to the council. Uh, so people are trying to uh, throw arrows in the blind. The way PEO's mandate is, we cannot deal it at that level, but it, there is a way we have to go step by step through uh, PSC and then before it can come to the council. And unfortunately, that has not been happening for the, uh, has not been happening. The, uh, the people who are who call, call themselves champions of environment and uh, putting this for issue at the forefront are not doing that. And, uh, and right. maybe Second there is uh, something that they are being misled. So yes, it's an important issue, but we have to deal it through PSC. Thank you very much, Vash. We're gonna switch up the order just a little bit. We're gonna to jump to uh, David Latt. So if you don't mind answering our question, David, um, why is climate change important for engineers and what can we do legally to make it important to PEO? Uh, hi, well, I, I believe uh, climate change is one of perhaps the top three societal issues that we have to deal with. Uh, and uh, EO has been largely absent in this in this space um, with a voice or with any kind of guidance to its to its uh, engineers uh, license holders. So from a legal perspective, I feel that we can develop uh, practice guidance. Um, there's uh, guidelines at the national level that could be used as a starting point for PEO uh, as well um, uh, being at the table with the provincial government. Um, in terms of there's there's big decisions going on with respect to infrastructure and PEO is largely absent, you know, taking into account uh, climate change and that as well. And I would also just say that you know, as as mentioned, climate change of course is not the only issue and not environment not the only issue. There are many other issues, and will we just have? I'm not saying that that's going to be my only focus, but it is a primary focus. Ten seconds. So. Um, but I feel that uh, it is one of the top issues where PEO has been absent. Thank you very much, David. We'll jump to Chantel. Chantel, if you're there with us, we'd like you to answer the question about climate change. How do you think it's important? Is it relevant to PEO? And what would you do to bring it forward to PEO on a legal standpoint? Thanks. Um, I think... Um both Vaj and uh, David did talk a little bit about the, the legal standpoint with regards to the climate, uh, the climate change and climate crisis. Um, it, I think it is a very important thing. And I think the only way that we can at council um, deal with that is through the committees that the, the practice standards committee that sets, uh, develops and sets standards and guidelines for council to um, approve because that's where it, where it um, lies. Uh, we, we regulate our license holders and the, and the profession. Um, so, so we're, you know, PEO is unable to, to, to do that from a, a legal standpoint, except through uh, the development of those guidelines and standards that we've all mentioned. Um, I have, I mean, everyone would, I think, is concerned about the environment. Personally, um, I'm a very, uh, you know, try to be green and uh, there's so many more things uh, for PEO to do. Um, but uh, I think working together and with the committees, I think that's the only way we can we can move that forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, Chantel. We appreciate your answers. Daniel, you are last but not least. Please give us your answer for climate change. How do you think it's relevant to PEO? And how would you um, say specifically that PEO legally can bring this to regulation? Thank you so much, there, Chris, and Dennis also for the question there. When I think about regulation and climate change, the thing that actually hits my mind the most is the Volkswagen emission scandal. As many of you know, that was a scandal where software engineers actually tried to cover the diesel emissions associated with vehicles to trick regulators in order for nothing more than profits. 
this is a huge scandal. This is something that made national headlines in Europe, in North America, throughout the entire world there. But it actually creates also a great opportunity for regulators like PO. It is a chance for us to break into the emerging disciplines associated with software engineers to let them know that there is a need for ethics training for these people. There is a need for a regulator that can hold them to standards. Just today, I actually had the opportunity to talk to somebody who's been a professional engineer working inside an environmental services group where we didn't need PN work previously. But if we can advocate for more regulation to have work done by PN, then we can make a fundamental change there. Thank you. Great timing, Daniel. Thank you for the question submitted. We will now be moving on to the next set of candidates running. We'll be moving on to vice president candidates. We have Michael Chan and Greg Lauchuk. We'll be beginning with Michael Chan. And we ask that we give him four minutes to speak about his candidate statement and try and answer the questions that we mentioned before, which is why is PEO council elections important? What is your plan to improve the low member engagement? And how do you plan to capture member interests concerns and bring them to council. Michael, are you with us? Yeah, I was that. Okay. Thank you very much. Your four minutes start now. Good evening. Thank you for your invitation. My name is Michael Chan. I'm running for the vice president. I'm one of a few, limited few, if not the only staff volunteer who is experienced in all aspects of PEO. As vice president, one must have an in-depth knowledge of the entire PEO operation, which includes council, committee, chapters, and staff. Following my continuous involvement in nearly 20 years as staff and volunteer of PEO. On the chapter, I'm eight years at PEO staff as chapter manager. I'm executive of Willowdale Thornhill chapter. For committees, I volunteers involvement uh, three years as ACV Advisory Committee Volunteer as a chair and over 10 years as member. On finance, I'm one year as vice chair and one year as chair of finance committee. Government liaison, I started the GLP 16 years ago and two years as member of GLC, the government liaison committee. Legal, I'm a committee member of the registry and discipline committee for over six years. On council, I'm eight years on council as staff member, three years on council as LGA, Lieutenant Governor appointee, and two years on executive committee. I'm one year on the newly formed GNC, the government nomination committee. I fully support the council's approval and started to put in place a system whereby PEO will be transformed to becoming a modern efficient regulator, protecting the public interest three years ago by using a three pillar approach. One is the operation and independent management consultant was retained to modernize the entire PEO operation. External regular review and external regular consultant were retained to review all PEO regular activities. Proposal for changes were presented and approved by council. Governance, GSI was retained a two year government roadmap following a agreed time work plan was proposed to transform council into a governance type port to be completed by 2020. For the past two years, I was deeply involved as a council of chair in this transform process as both a member of the executive committee and the governance and nomination committee. With the experience knowledge gained, I can help move forward to complete the transform process. Council election is one of the most important activities of the year for PEO. It is a time that we work hard to find the right candidate for council, a successful, efficient council, depending entirely on what we can find. Now, what is a successful election? We have to get the right people, more candidates running, and a high percentage of voting. One minute in, left. Okay, so in, in preventing of a council approval process, that is structure, transfer, and objective, for active recruiting, evaluating, and selecting qualified diverse candidates. Recruiting driven by needed competence and attribute in goals with general skills, industrial experience, equity, 
diversity inclusion and prepare a pre-orientation online module to outline the role of council, to sort out the characters council and the PEO public, public protection mandate. So how can we get our voice heard to, uh, at the council? The number of ways. One is that through the chapters, you can go to the RCC and bring them to council or through one of the four governing committee, which is formed or at the annual PO AGM. And lastly, you can contact any councillors to put it on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. We really appreciate your candidate statement today. We'll now be moving on to our next candidate running for vice president, Greg Wauchuk. Greg, are you with us? I am indeed. <clears throat> Excellent, Greg. You have four minutes. You'll get a warning at one minute left. And we'd like you to answer the question about why is PEO Council elections important? What's your plan to improve the lower member engagement? And how do you plan to capture member interests and concerns and bring that to council along with your statement? Your four minutes start now. Hello, uh, York Chapter. My name is Greg Wojcik. I've been active in PEO affairs for over two decades. I've served two terms on PEO Council and I was PEO's executive analyst in 2011 and 2012. I too know my way around PEO and uh, our uh, staff. I chaired the powerful communications committee during a period of great change at PEO. Um, We've been hearing about this uh, great transformation that's underway. Uh, council is totally redesigning PEO and never bothered to ask our opinion or obtain our approval. Council also passed a resolution to renege on its promise to put Pete to a member's referendum. My opponent, Mr. Chan, voted in favor of the latter and strongly supports the former. This is not okay. Uh, I want to answer the question about why elections are important. Um, uh, Mr. Chan made a reference to uh, elections being necessary for the right people to get on council. I find that a little bit offensive. It's the job of the elector, not of council, to decide who the right people are for, uh, the, for the job. And elections are important because they're about the only channel we have left for members to voice their concerns. It also allows candidates to lay their ideas before the 86,000 members. Now, I know a lot of, a lot of the uh, bad things that have happened at council lately, um, I consider them illegitimate because the, ca the candidates did not present these uh, during their campaigns. Uh, I think Peak is an example. Uh, very few people uh, stated their position on Peak. Uh, and uh, therefore, they don't have a mandate to do these things. Now, regarding low member uh, engagement, uh, what we don't need is weasel words. Uh, communication and transparency are what we need. Uh, if I uh, get on council, I would uh, act to restore the print edition of uh, Dimensions and uh, greatly overhaul our communications with our members. I wrote an article for the Kingston Whig Standard a few years ago, it's on my website, about why uh, voters are so disengaged. And that's a big problem at PEO. We have only slightly over 10% of our members voting. So we need to address that. We have to stop ignoring members' input. At the last AGM, we had five resolutions that were passed and they got shuffled off to the staff and staff reported back to council that they didn't need to do anything about it. So you wonder why the members are disengaged. There you have it. Now, how do we bring members' concerns to councils? Well, the, the best way, uh, really the only way right now is the elections and the AGMs. Uh, what I would do is enhance uh, the role of uh, chapters in bringing uh, concerns from the grassroots up to council. And one more thing I wanted to say about a members' concerns being brought to council, the changes in structure being proposed- One minute left would make it more difficult for councillors to put things on the agenda. They wanna centralize power and take it away from individual councillors and they wanna take it away from individual members. 
And this is not good for the organization. We are self-regulated profession and we have to defend this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Greg, for answering our questions today. We have a question in the chat from Mr. Carlos. These questions will be both to Mr. Michael Chan and Greg Wauchuk. The question is, what is your definition of meaningful consultation? And what is your definition of effective consultation? So meaningful consultation, effective consultation. You have one minute to answer. We will start with Greg. Well, I think I just touched on that in, in, in my um, chat a minute ago. Meaningful consultation and communication is bi-directional. It's not top-down. It's not council deciding things in a vacuum, holding secret meetings that aren't minuted, making decisions, and then passing them on down to the uh, membership to uh, comply with. We have For meaningful communications, the communications have to flow in both directions. And, uh, you know, council really has to wake up and start listening to our members. We have to engage them. We can't allow any more member alienation. And if we continue on this path, that's where we're headed. Thank you, Greg. Michael, you're up next. We'd like you to answer the question from Mr. Carlos regarding what is your definition of meaningful consultation and what is your definition of effective consultation? Your one minute starts now. You're on mute, Michael, you're on mute. We'll reset the clock for you. Okay, meaningful with, uh, consultation means we consult in a meaningful way. What does that mean? That means that we have to have the right question, right question asked so that we can get the right answer. It had to be not long-winded, it had to be precise so that people know exactly what we are consulting on. Now, effective is to, to be not, uh, not every time is a referendum is effective. We have to find the most a uh, useful, effective way to get the answers and get the right answers and go to uh, um, more people, if possible, all, but not all the time. So if not all the 87, maybe they're through the chapters, maybe through the councillors, maybe through the committees. So not necessarily a referendum is the most effective way. Thank you very much, Michael. We will now be moving on to the present elect candidates. Today we have with us Darla Campbell, who will be giving her four minute candidate statement. And again, we'd like her to answer the four, the three questions rather about uh, PO council elections. Uh, Darla, are you with us? I am. Fantastic and welcome. So I'll just repeat the three questions for you. Uh, why is PEO council elections important? What is your plan to improve the low member engagement? And lastly, how do you plan to capture member interests and bring them to council? We'd appreciate your candidate statement and answering those three questions. Your four minutes start now. Uh, thanks, Christopher. Would you mind showing my picture? Right. Thank you. That'd be really helpful. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks, Christopher, for moderating. Uh, thanks, Oliver, for organizing this event, and to the York chapter for sure for for uh, putting this event together. There's nothing more important than having these conversations uh, during an election campaign to share <laughs> ideas and the visions that we have, the vision that we have for the possibilities ahead of us um, at PEO and at PEO Council. Um, PEO, as you know, is celebrating its 100th anniversary just around the corner, um, and that's a very significant milestone. And is it also an opportunity for PEO to um, focus on how to how to deliver regulatory services um, about, and protecting the public uh, interest in Ontario for the next hundred years? 
so I see that the work that uh, council has been doing with respect to governance um, is, it, is interesting if you think of it as a kind of a renovation project um, that allows uh, an organization to get organized and to maybe clean up and to set, set the stage for um, you know, new opportunities. And so I see my role as president-elect uh, moving into president and then past president in the three-year term, uh, being able to, to uh, really move forward with some of these key issues that, that perhaps um, might feel like PO is falling a little bit behind. So my key priorities are enhancing standards and practice guidelines, um, in, uh, accelerating and modernizing the licensing process, embracing chapters as a model of communities of support. Chapters are very important uh, in PEO. They're the backbone of, of PEO and are really important uh, to continue to support and learn from chapters as, as a conduit for information, for communication, um, both uh, top down and bottom up. Um, advocating where the public interest is at risk, uh, PEO um, cannot um, um, abdicate their opportunity to have a voice, especially when there are changes um, that might be happening with respect to the Engineering Act. Um, there would need, we would need to have a voice at the table. So there is an important time for PEO to advocate um, where the public interest is at risk. So we need to be able to speak for ourselves as an organization on behalf of regulating engineering in the province. And then my fifth um, um, priority is operating in a global world. We need to regulate locally, but we need to think about how we function globally. Uh, and that's a key uh, part of, of my campaign. Um, I really would like to uh, speak to the key questions that uh, are before us and thank you to uh, the York chapter for sending us those questions. So it is, it is uh, important for PEO members uh, to vote because that's part of our self-regulatory, um, it, it's a privilege to, to be able to self-regulate in the province of Ontario. And um, one of the ways to show that uh, we are engaged and interested in self-regulation is in fact by voting, by casting a vote by choosing our left. leaders moving forward. Um, I have, have a, a very, um, I have a good skill set when it comes to listening. Um, and um, I will utilize that in the role of uh, president-elect. Um, I um, hope to visit all 30, 36 chapters uh, in this year, 2022, um, in learning and listening from you. Um, what are the issues? What are the problems, opportunities that can go into the strategic plan that is being updated uh, at that, that for the new strategic plan for 2023 to, to 2025? Um, and so listening um, um, to chapters, listening to the public, what does the public expect of a modern regulator? Um, and I think there was a third question around ideas coming forward. I think we need to find opportunities um, for good ideas to come forward, um, not just at AGMs and not just during the election cycle, but um, throughout the year. So that PEO needs to have something like a question box uh, or ideas box and suggestion box in order to get ideas forward. So I'm gonna stop there because I am out of time. Thank you so much for the opportunity and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Darla. We appreciate you being here today. Our next member going for president-elect is Royden Frazier. I do not believe Royden is with us this evening, unless I stand corrected. Royden, are you with us? I didn't see him logged in either. So, Royden, you there? There you are. Just, just got online here, yes. Perfect timing. <laughs> you said seven o'clock. <laughs> oh no, six o'clock. No, no, no. I said I said I'd be late, and oh. and then Oliver said that you know by seven to be fine. But no worries. Well, Ryan, we're happy you can join us today. You have four minutes to give your candidate statement and also answer three questions that the York chapter has prepared. The first question is: Why is PEO Council elections important? The second: What is your plan to improve the low member engagement? And how do you plan to capture member interests and bring them to council? So we'd like you to answer those three questions. You'll get a uh, one minute heads up when your time is almost over. And then uh, we will uh, go to the next candidate. So thank you very much. And your four minutes start now. So just a quick question. Did you want me to say something? Or did you want me just to answer the questions? Uh, no, so give uh, your candidate statement you have you have four minutes to give your candidate statement. And as part of that four minutes, 
um, we'd like you to answer those three questions. You can answer them at the end or at the beginning, whichever you choose. Okay, and then could you just repeat the third question for me? I was writing them down, didn't capture them all. Yep. Um, so the last question is, how do you plan to capture member interests, concerns, and bring them to council? Okay, well, thank you very much um, for the invitation tonight uh, to the uh, York Chapter AGM. <laughs> I highly value the chapter system, and I certainly believe it shouldn't be threatened by uh, governance reforms, but strengthened by guaranteed support. But chapters are critical to the, uh, critically important to uh, PEO, to a self-regulated PEO. And uh, my vision is that PO become a global leader in self-regulation and member-oriented self-regulation in particular. And I'll go into some details on that where it exemplifies relevant, win-win, value-added regulation. And if there's further questions, I can answer what that all means. But I want to be the, in essence, it means to be the first regulator that's inviting to emerging disciplines, inviting to entrepreneurs, inviting to natural scientists, Many of them today engage in what I would call unlicensed professional engineering. And to be clear, I tried to drive home the idea of relevancy for more than a decade on council with my yearly please, 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 no governance for one year, please deal with the big issues. Uh, we know where council has gone, it's gone into the governance uh, hole of. Uh, trying to solve things with methods and not actually tackling the problems. So council failed to listen. And unfortunately, the concept of relevancy has now been mutated and deformed into the current governance changes that you see before us that are neutering self-regulation. But just listen to the videos that used to be posted on the website. They removed them because of a complaint of mine. But those videos that they posted during the election period on the PO website, said things like, council should be committed to big governance, never said the big issues. It talked about the right people on council, not the best. And it even talked about how councillors are selected, no mention of elected. These subtle biases are simply an unconscious reflection of the autocratic culture that has infected PEO. Um, I've always been a strong defender of a member-oriented, self-regulated, knowledge-based, decision-making and transparent PO. And I would bring my decades of experience and insights to PO as count and onto council as president-elect. Now there's three questions. Why PO election is important? Well, bottom line is member oriented. This is the starting point of actually choosing who's going to control what happens at PO. And are you gonna have a member oriented PO or are you gonna have an autocratic top-down decision-making um, body? It's your choice. That's why the elections in this particular year are important. They're always important for feedback on the issues raised by the candidates. Low member engagement. One minute left. Thank you. Low member engagement. That's one where you have to go back to what I was saying. Value added, relevant regulation. Uh, you, you make things valuable. For example, uh, I'll just give a quick example on continuing professional development. It should be voluntary where we are basically advertising those who get engaged the process and providing some benefit. Um, I can explain that more later if people wish. But the last question was capture the membership interest. Well, the way to capture membership interest is to make it relevant to the profession. A graduated license would help with that, uh, for example. You gotta capture their interest first and then feed them along the way. So please, vote in this election that's most important i look forward to the rest of your agm tonight and any further questions at the end but uh i think my time is uh, about up now so um thank you very much for the invitation and chance to speak thank you very much Royden. we appreciate you joining us in record timing our next candidate for president elect is marilyn spink uh, marilyn spink has actually uh, uh, will not be joining us today and has taken on uh, what she calls the uh, Hazel McKellian uh, way of doing things, letting her work speak for herself. We'll leave up her candidate statement for just a few seconds for those that want to review it 
or check out her LinkedIn or website um, for any more information. Any questions can be directed directly to Marilyn Spink about her uh, running for candidate. So we will now open the floor to questions and answers uh, for the present elect candidates. So for those that are still here, Darla and Royden, uh, we'd ask you to participate in the Q&A. You will have one minute uh, to answer the questions. I'll give you a uh, heads up at about 10 seconds. And we have a number of questions um, from the chat room. And I thank everyone for those who have been uh, participating in the Q&A. The first question is from Gabriel, and it's about the value of the PNG. And what is your plan to enhance the quality of services provided by licensed engineers? and in turn build confidence and enhance the profile of the profession in general. So this speaks to the value. Again, uh, we'll start with Darla. Uh, so what's your plan to enhance the quality of services provided by PNGs? That is an most excellent question. And I don't know if I can answer that in a minute. So thank, thank you. I, I, um, some have said that the value of the PNG actually belongs yes. in this category. Um, and and um, I actually uh, agree with the person who's asked the question that that there there is a role for PEO um, in their regulatory uh, function to be um, be focused on um, delivering. Um, Bringing bringing people who are qualified um, into the into the profession and in the licensing process, um, and then from a, from a. Um, uh, and then ensuring ensuring that throughout throughout one's career that that there that there are practice standards to follow that there are practice guidelines um, and that there is relevance to the work that we're doing. Um, I would love to speak more about about the the value of the PNG. I feel strongly that there is a missed opportunity um, in order to elevate the the uh, value of professional engineers. So I'll leave it at that because I know a minute went by quickly. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Great timing, Darla. Thank you very much. Uh, Royden, over to you. Yeah, Your thank you. I'd like to, starts now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the value of the PNG is exactly what this selection is about. It's exactly what I'm standing for. There are many ways to do it. I will give a few examples. Demand side legislation. PO should be pushing for it in these emerging discipline areas. That's one way. We should have, and that's the sort of stick way. There's the inviting way. We could be posting resumes and CVs of engineers on their CBD program, voluntary, by the way, which basically acts as a form of advertisement of what we're capable of, how we differentiate ourselves from technologists and technicians, the great things that we've done. Easily accessible on the web. Can't do that today. Can't walk into a classroom and say, here's what engineers do. Let me show you some great examples. I was on the national, um, sorry, on the natural science um, task force. And what they're afraid of is Ten enforcement. Seconds. So we need to uh, consider how to have a graduated process where people won't be afraid of enforcement. And I'll bring emerging disciplines in. There's many ways to do it. I have other ideas. Thank you. Time's up. Thank you very much, Jordan. So we have another question. And this one was uh, from Shengis. Thank you very much, Shengis, for bringing this question up. There are also other chat questions about this same topic. And it speaks to um, Bill 27 and the Canadian experience requirement. Uh, so the question is, what is your position about Bill 27 and removing the Canadian experience requirement from the licensing process and how it would impact the PEO licensing process? Uh, Royden, we'll actually start with you this time. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Canadian experience, great, great, great topic. Uh, I will tell you, it's a great opportunity to have it removed. It has been a barrier to many engineers trying to get a job. And it's not just the foreign engineers coming in, it's also people in companies that don't have a PNG within that company to actually act as that supervisor for the one year Canadian experience. I would tell you what I would do. And I have a multi path approach. I would still have a time frame. I would allow a competency approach to be used. I would allow there to be a challenge for credit approach. I would allow there to be a provisional license be used as basically a probationary period. There are a lot of good ideas on how that can be done. When I worked on the evolution of engineering admissions task force, we went through these ideas and they've been sitting on the shelf. It's time for them to be dusted off. Thank you. Thank you. You have 10 more seconds if you'd like to say oh, anything else. I, sorry, I was looking at my watch and I just saw I yeah. miscalculated, but we've used up to 10 seconds now. <laughs> yep, no worries. 
Okay, so Darla, same question. Uh, what is your position on Bill 27 and removing the Canadian experience requirement from the licensing process? How would this impact the PEO licensing process? You have one minute, wish you luck, here you are. Thanks, thanks, Christopher. Um, so this fits in uh, uh, nicely with my key priority of accelerating and modernizing the licensing process. Um, and the barriers that exist for those who are um, are tra internationally trained, um, who who have had challenges, and, and we hear about that um, on a regular basis, um, especially um, as they visit chapters, the challenges associated with getting that Canadian experience and getting the right Canadian experience. So I, uh, I agree with removing that barrier to, uh, uh, to be able to become licensed. Um, however, there is an important aspect to being able to prove competency um, or, to, or to ensure that, that as, as, as uh, people are being welcomed into the into the profession uh, through the through PO's function as a regulator Absolutely. that that there is there is a there is a competency and the ability for these uh, these professionally uh, internationally trained engineers to meet the standards and to be able to deliver the uh, and to serve and protect the public interest. Time's up. Thank you very much, Darla. We really appreciate that. So we have uh, one more question here, and we are going to review that question really quick. Quickly, it is what candidates stand on chapter system, regulatory versus advocacy. And uh, this came from the chapter and we'll actually start with Darla this time. So again, what's candidates stand? So what is your stand on the chapter system and the regulatory versus the advocacy kind of poll? Your one minute starts now. Um, as the, um, I, I served on the Government Liaison Committee uh, when it was initially established to help coordinate the Government Liaison Program in all the chapters, and um, I served as Chair of Government Liaison Committee. Through that, through that role, I had my finger on the pulse of uh, the issues and the balancing act of advocacy between the, between OSPE's role um, and between the work that, that, uh, that important messaging for, for the GLP reps to be able to, to share with, with the government reps. I was really pleased to see at the, at the uh, East Toronto chapter, um, the information um, of, of how many GLP reps there are actually having those connections with MPPs. I think that that's an essential role that chapters can continue to play. And there are other ways that chapters can continue to support the regulatory function of, of PEO. Um, not the least of which is to, is to help us feel that we're not alone. Um, you know, one of the risks um, in in a, in, a, in a operating uh, is is when we're alone, um, we, we aren't sorry, able yes. to... Sorry, was that time? time? Yeah, ten I, seconds. Okay. Yeah. When no when we'll when, when we seconds. when we function alone, when we don't have a peer review, when we don't have a network, we don't have uh, uh, colleagues to be able to to support our success. Um, that's a risk, and I, I see that chapters has the ha, uh, provide the opportunity so that uh, engineers are connected in the province uh, and are not. Sorry, Darla, so, that's time. Okay, my thanks. apologies. Okay, Royden, you're up next. Uh, the question is, what's your position on the chapter system and regulatory versus advocacy? Yeah, I, this seconds. is a great question. The I'll say right away what it is not. Chapters are not part of operations. Chapters are part of the source of new blood. Chapters are part of the communication of what engineering um, is to the public, to encourage people to continue on in their sciences and maths, because that's what interests a lot of volunteers that join the chapters. The question about chapters is, is why do people join? Because they want to do something for the profession. It's a networking opportunity. This is not a matter of, you know, you do regulatory things, chapters do some of that, but you've got to gauge it towards what is of interest to the members that join the chapters and make this profession better and promote the profession. And so they're not regulatory, they're not operational, and the role of a chapter is, like I said, it's to basically allow us to promote the profession. Thank you. The uh, a counselor recently said they're part of operations and they're not that. So time's up. Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. So we have one final question here and it's regarding the governance uh, model. So uh, where do you see the benefit of governance to the members and to the profession? Uh, Darla, we'll start with you. 
Uh, so uh, governance is just a really a fancy word to say that this is how we function. This is how we operate. And um, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the important work that council has been doing in, the, in its transformation initiative is really like a renovation uh, you know, that you're doing on your house. There are improvements that are happening um, to, to create new opportunities and new service delivery. Um, there, th the governance, uh, the new governance model will assist PEO and PEO council in being able to be more effective, um, more efficient and be able to be clear on their focus, be able to provide direction uh, to staff and, to, and to, the, to the organization and be able to control and measure the success in moving forward. So it's not, so council's role is to decide, to set the what needs to be done. Those are the priorities that goes into your strategic plan, um, not so much about the how. Perfect. So focusing on the what, and my favorite saying is, is keep, keep your nose in and your fingers out. So be nosy about how uh, about what's being done, whether the metrics are being met, what the gap in achieving what your goals are, um, but don't actually do it. And so that, that's what the governance is allowing uh, council to do. Time's up. Sorry, Darla. Thank you for your answers. Uh, Royden, you'll have a one minute opportunity to answer the same question. And that is, what do you, where do you see the benefits of governance for the members in the profession? Your one minute starts oh, now. Yeah, great. Governance is simply a tool to solve problems. They're putting the tool in front of actually knowing the problems. And then they're gonna to try to solve the problems with a given tool. You don't use a hammer to saw. You gotta figure out what actually works. There are problems with the current governance model. It is basically alienating members. Volunteers are becoming much less willing to volunteer. There's been a lot of resentment to how PO has actually implemented things without asking members. We are, have a less knowledge-based system at the moment. It's staff information, not member information, not peer information getting to council. It is definitely filtered big time. There's secret meetings. There's a lot of issues here, but the problem is governance is a tool. 10 seconds. To solve a problem. You don't grab the tools first and then look for a problem. You look for the problem and then you let the model adapt and governance should adapt and we'll let it Thanks, adapt sir. in the future. Yeah. Thank you, Royden. Thank you, Darla, for your answers today. Uh, we have, we'll take one more final question. And that question is, um, sorry, just moved here. Uh, what we do to boost member participation in PEO and name your top idea if you have one. We'll give one minute and 30 seconds for this question. And again, the question is, what will we do to boost member participation and interest in PEO and name your top idea? And uh, Darla, we'll start with you. All right, so I'm going to uh, share an idea that I have because the question has come up. So there, there is, uh, there's an opportunity, and this ties to the to the value of the PN question that came up earlier. There, there, there is an opportunity for for chapters could even take a take a leadership role in this is to is to encourage uh, PNGs uh, in Ontario to be incorporating the PNG after their name um, where um, as much as possible and certainly where 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 uh, it, it's important for the public to know that you're a professional engineer. Um, I think that we have become um, not as proud um, as we should be in, in letting people know that we are licensed and that we are a professional engineer. So that's just one idea. It's it, it's it's not a huge idea, but I think it could make it, you know, a significant difference in the branding and, and the approach of, of, of us feeling like we're part of the same profession. So um, that would be my idea to incorporate um, an and, and maybe it's a bit of a campaign, you know, around March 1st, which is the uh, engineering day in Ontario to encourage PNGs to add that to their LinkedIn profile, right? To have PNG there, so it's, so it's clear. Oh, we have 10 more seconds because it's one and a half. So yep. Christopher, That's you're right. out there on that one. Um, and so, 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 the, so, the, so, so that the ripple effect would be in your signature line network um, and professors at universities who are who are PNGs should also be having having their uh, PNG uh, publicly available um, in the syllabus so that students who are taking their courses know that they're being taught by a professional engineer as an example. Time's up. Great timing. Thank you very much, Charla. Royden, you're up. You have one minute and a half. You'll get a heads up at 15 seconds. Your time starts now. Okay, well, asking for one idea is the wrong question. You should be asking for multiple ideas because it's gonna take a multi-pronged approach. 
I would give you two right now, graduated licenses. First thing is you pass the, you pass the uh, professional ethics exam. That's going to get you a little bit of ability to start practicing some engineering, maybe on a probationary purpose. You get through that probation, you go into probation, you're not going to be enforced upon as long as you fall within restrictions. You build upon that. It has to be done in such a way that it's a gamified. If it's gamified, it may be of interest to entrepreneurs to promote their business, to have certain certifications along the way of this. Certifications go along with this graduated license. Another thing. We could be doing advertising. This is the voluntary CPD. You report what you want and we make it easily accessible to the public. And then they start seeing what people do. And it's gonna be competitive because you're gonna to want to advertise things and show that you're better, the engineers have a skill set above say the technology and technicians are competing against in some fields or against other engineers. And it's a gamified system. It works, ISO worked. It worked because it's based upon industrial engineering principles of quality insurance quality and it builds on itself and it just grows but you have to add value along the way and yeah, 15 seconds 15 seconds okay so the value added comes to the uh, entrepreneur the entrepreneur has this valley of death in the first two years well if there is actually something that could be certified for saying that they got something a little extra credential stamped by po that could be a I'm benefit. Sorry, in time, so. that's fine Lots of ideas. Thank you very much both for answering those questions. Uh, we have a, one last question we'll slip in here um, as the final question for the night for the present elect candidates. And it's about the elections itself. Uh, I'm gonna reword this question a little bit. Uh, thank you, Shengis, for providing the question. Um, and it, we're gonna reword it just a little bit to make it um, a little more oriented for the platform. Uh, if you were in a position of power, how would you change the election process for PEO? And we're gonna give a minute and a half for this question as well. And Royden, we're gonna start with you. Thank you very much. There'd be many changes I would make to the process. The first one I would start is the Central Elections and Search Committee would not be made up of councillors or past councillors. It would be made up of members in the general population out of our 85,000 members where there was no bias or you know if any biases they'd be offset by basically the random nature of picking people so there'd be no ability to have clicks of ideas continue on that'd be number one number two i'd be looking at past decisions made by the sexual election and search committee when there have been complaints put forward i'd be looking at those decisions to see if there should be changes done for example the general way that the decisions made is if it's not in the rules, it's okay. Just this election, I actually put in a complaint that they weren't following the caretaker convention when they posted the videos, which they did take down. And the, but they didn't tell you why they took them down. And they had those e-blasts that actually dealt with the governance issue. The caretaker convention is the government, or in this case, PO, is not supposed to interfere on a topic that is prime and central within the election. Imagine if the Canadian government started having its ministries and employees promoting the current seconds. government. How much? Yeah. So the caretaker convention, but what did they do? It wasn't in the rules. We're going to ignore it and not even propose it for future policy. There are so much I would change to make basically the process independent of council. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Rodin. We appreciate your answers. Darla, you have a minute and a half to answer the question. Again, uh, we appreciate your time. I'll give you 15 seconds warning when the time is up. Your time starts now. Yeah, th thanks for the question. Um, there are a couple of, of uh, things that are curious about the pr current process. Uh, and one of them, building on, on Royden's comment about the, the uh, Central Election Search Committee, um, I always found it curious that the um, junior counselor, junior regional counselor was responsible to find candidates to run against this, the senior uh, regional counselor um, when up for, for election um, on the alternate years. I just thought that was that was interesting um, dynamic there. Um, I think that there is room for improvement, especially when we have three uh, regional counselor positions that have been acclaimed in this election. Um, we talked earlier about the importance of, of, uh, of voting and being engaged in, a, in, in, a, in the process 
process. I think that if we have um, men, lots of acclaimed positions, that doesn't uh, bode well for our level of being able to, to prove that we are interested in self-regulating. And so I think that those are sort of indicators, not that the candidates who put their names forward aren't great candidates. So I just want to be super clear about that. It's the fact that, that they have not had the opportunity to be part of this process. And I believe that uh, in a democracy that these, these uh, debates, these questions, these, uh, these challenging questions, these, these responses, this is an important part of understanding the issues for, uh, for members to be able to raise issues, to ask questions and to, and to understand who they're voting for. And, and, and so when we have acclaimed candidates, uh, we, we, they, they don't have that opportunity. Um, so that's an idea that I have uh, to improve the election process. Thank you very much, Tarla. Okay, I think that's it for questions to directed for the present elect candidates. And I think we're almost out of time as well. We thank everyone for participating in the questions in the chat. If we reworded your questions today, uh, we'd like to let you know that uh, we have done that uh, intentionally to make it more focused for the elections. And uh, we appreciate everyone's uh, input for today. If you'd like to ask these candidates any further questions, Please don't hesitate to reach out to them directly. Their platforms were uh, visible and stated here today. If the candidates would like, they can put their contact info in the chat. We'll leave it open for a few moments before we move on to the closing remarks. Again, thank you very much. And I'll be passing it on to Christian Bellini, our president-elect, to give a few words. Christian, you're up. Uh let me just get my camera up here. Yeah, I, I'm not going to say very much. I think uh, thanks very much, Christopher, uh, and great job moderating. I think this was a really productive session. Uh, I'd like to thank all the candidates and the attendees for attending tonight. Uh, you know, I people will know over the years that York Chapter has a very well-deserved reputation as one of PEO's most active and with great member engagement. And over the years, York has hosted this event on many occasions, and I've attended it on quite a number. Uh, today was a great opportunity for the candidates to exchange ideas and for members to ask questions and learn more about the election issues. And I'm sure that you've all found this to be a very informative session. I really would encourage everybody now to go out and cast your votes. Uh, it really is part of your, uh, part of your duty. And uh, I gather that instructions on voting are going to follow uh, just for anybody who's, uh, who needs any more information. So thanks everybody again for attending and uh, have a great evening. Thank you everyone. And thank you very much, Christian, for your wise words and leadership. Before everyone leaves, I just wanna pass it on to Oliver, who will be giving us the voting instructions. And the voting instructions are how you cast your vote. So Oliver, please take it away. Thank you, Christopher. And uh, thank you for your kind words, uh, Christian. Um, so just want to go through uh, last two slides uh, for tonight's event here. Um, here's a screenshot of our current voter turnout uh, from the PO website. So we are at um, 6,243 votes uh, based on the last time I uh, checked on the website yesterday. Uh, it's a roughly only 7.23%. Uh, of the uh, possible votes. And you can see here there's a comparison uh, with uh, individual weekly votes with uh, year 2021. Uh, as you can see here, we are dropping in numbers compared to the, uh, the past year. So we really encourage everyone here to please place your vote. Uh, we want to hear your voice and it is really important for you to voice uh, uh, for our profession, for the future of our profession, and uh, also being, you know, participating and active with PO, not only just, um, you know, pay for your license. Um, so that being said, uh, I'm just going to quickly go over um, the voting procedure. So how do you vote? You should have already received multiple emails if you haven't voted yet from Clear Picture. Uh, with providing your voter ID and PIN. And once you have that, please go to povote.ca uh, and click on the vote uh, about the mid of the page there. You will enter your ID and your PIN uh, for the login and then you can place your vote. If you have any questions or require any assistance, 
uh, please contact Clear Picture Help Desk um, at uh, this number, uh, 1-844-818-1774. Uh, and uh, if you guys don't have an email registration with PO, you probably already received the package, the voting package through the mail. So again, the date uh, that the voting closes is February 18th, 2022. So you'll have approximately 10 more days to do that. Uh, and the vote end at 4 p.m. We recorded this session uh, through our platform. So we'll be posting it uh, on our YouTube channel, on our website. So please feel free to uh, direct that to your friends, colleagues, uh, fellow engineers, um, and promote uh, them to make sure that uh, uh, they vote. All right. So that being said, thank you again, everyone, for uh, attending our candidate meeting uh, today. Uh, and thank you so much to all the candidates who were able to join us and share the idea. Um, and also thank you so much to Christopher uh, for moderating the whole session. It's uh, amazing work and uh, great to having uh, you as our uh, counselor here. So that being said, uh, I'm going to pause the recording.